to dinner with and monthly conversation with exceptional creative talents to help inform and inspire next generation creatives. And today we're having dinner with the incomparable Mona Chalabi. Hey, Mona. Hi, Norish. So if you're one of the 440,000 people who follow Mona on Instagram, she'll need no introduction, but I'll give you one anyway. She's a precocious writer, filmmaker, artist, and designer. Uh, she's a columnist for The Guardian and The New York Times. Have I got that right? Occasional writer, columnist? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll take it. <laughs> and, and whose super sharp illustrations have revealed tax evasions, gender pay gaps, the rate of extinction, and much, much more. Um, she's recently posted an illustration pointing out that certain companies who donate to Pride also donate to homophobic politicians, which is just a perfect example of the way she holds power to account. Um, and this extraordinary polymath has been nominated for an Emmy, and her outstanding visualizations have even been commended by the Royal Statistical Society. We're very lucky to have her here today. So in our metaphorical dinner, Mo Mona's going to share a starter, which is a project that marks her out at the beginning of her career or gave us some indication of the path she was going to take. Then a main course, which is um, an, an interesting project defining, a sort of career defining project or something substantial she's recently done. And lastly, the next meal, which is a project by someone else or an artist who's inspiring her about what creativity can be going forward. And please remember to put your questions in the chat window because uh, it's not just me who's having dinner with um, Mona, but it's all of us who's having dinner with Mona and we should all be in the conversation. So uh, Mona, welcome. So um, I'll, I'll kick off if, you, if, you, if that's okay. And uh, then as the questions come in, we can start to ask those. Um, yes. And I'm just going to start with um, I'm going to start with sometimes where we uh, we've finished one or two of these conversations, which is about um, thinking. I know you're going to give a lot of inspiration um, today, but I wonder if we could just think a little bit more practically. Um, you know, we've got people who are um, starting their career right now. It's always a challenging moment for anyone and their confidence and their um, you know artistic direction. I think um, it's the, the job market's quite difficult right now, um, you know, and there's a lot of questions about university fees and loans, et cetera. And I just wonder if you were starting your career out now, what are the, what are the practical things that you would say to yourself, do you think? Mm. That's such a good question. Um, also, thanks for having me. Sorry, I didn't say that on <laughs> Um I honestly think that like, the more that you can um, learn practical skills, the better. So like, you know, learning, this is gonna sound really, really stupid, but like learning the Adobe suite was really helpful to me. Um, I mean, it sounds so incredibly basic, but um, because, because the software for making work, I think is changing so often, I think the more of that stuff you can learn, the better. Even if you're like, <sighs> It's kind of like it all feeds into your growth. So even if you have no plans whatsoever to become an animator, to learn the mechanics of animation, I think can ultimately make you a better illustrator, right? Like it's all- Definitely. Um, yeah, I don't really think that answers your question. Because do, you think, <laughs> do, you, do you think that because do you feel sometimes that um, um, younger creators aren't doing that? Do you feel mm -hmm. they're not? mastering the tools or working out enough of the tools before they get creative no, it's, a good thing to, it's a good thing to do i think i'm saying that because it's a good thing to do and for me personally I, okay i can only really speak i guess from my personal experience but like for me i really really i really struggled at university hated it dropped out had a miserable time um i struggled when i first started making work and to to learn a skill and to be like oh okay like I didn't know how to like adjust the layer mask on this thing and now I understand how to do it is satisfying it's like reassuring that you can grow because you didn't know how to do this thing and now you do and I think especially when your confidence has been knocked either because you're in a job that is not fulfilling you're in a job where your colleagues don't necessarily respect you or because you're in a really really tough job market to get that reassurance which you can do for free, assuming that you have the time to be able to do it, um, and assuming you understand how to legally download software, um, 
like is is a good thing to do i think maybe for me at least uh, yeah. I, I i i agree do you do you feel um that learning process is something that you've continued to do throughout your career as was that something you had to do at the beginning or is that something that, that is ongoing the whole way through the whole oh, way through. Like, literally today um i'm working on something different which i guess we'll talk to or we'll talk about when we get to the dessert thing and i needed a new piece of software that i haven't used before and I, think, I thought that same instinctive of like, oh, like, can't I just do this in, in a Google Doc instead of learning what the fuck an FDX thing is? But then it's just like, you just have to like, I don't know, just kind of push past that somehow yeah. and figure it out. Yeah. Definitely. Um, a question in from uh, Taylor, which is, um, uh, Taylor's asking you how you, um, how you attain the level of online success that you've achieved, you know? What were the what were the what were the things that did that? Is it um, was it about features in magazines? Was it about blogs? Um... Um, I think that actually, any time I've been featured somewhere, I've had like a, a tiny tiny bump. Um, for for me, the biggest thing that grew um, the Instagram following was the generosity of strangers who had a large following. So the very first post I did that like got me a significant bump was um, I had I think I had 62 Instagram followers at the time and I still to this day have no clue how we found it. I did an illustration about male circumcision rates where I just drew like these little four penises and they were of like different lengths that showed circumcision rates. And somehow Jerry Saltz, who is the art critic at the at, um, New York magazine, found it and posted on his Instagram feed and I went from like 62 followers to 2000 and like that kind of right. exponential bump is what has happened every single time someone who has significantly more followers than me has shared my work um so it's all I, I still don't know how he found it I really don't so it's 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 your work resonating with other people who've got more followers who post you and then you get the bounce I guess yeah yeah but it feels quite crude and calculated but I guess it is yeah, I don't know. Is it calculated? It's not calculated in that I'm not trying to make the illustration for Jerry Saltz, and you never yeah. know who that person is going to be. So I'm never creating an illustration that's like, maybe if I get it in front of this influencer. But I do think, um, I don't know, I feel so conflicted about it. Like, I think it's all really, really bad and corrupt. And there are so many people who are so, so, and I'm not just saying this to sound humble. There are people who are so much more talented than me who don't have the following that I have. Um, but at the same, like the reason why I still don't want to completely, completely write it off is because it like, I've benefited so much from it. It feels, I'm hesitant to like shit on that system, you know? Yeah. Like, I wouldn't be where I'm at if I hadn't been for Instagram. But I think where, wherever you are in life, there's people less successful, more talented. I mean, that's just the way of life, isn't it? So, um, I mean, when you talk about um, circumcision, uh, a question that, that springs to me is like, you um, you know, you talk about, you know, your work covers various subjects. I know you, you've, um, you've, done, a, you've done pieces all about, um, declining social standards or, um, or government provision in Iraq, for example, it, um, corporate taxes paid, um, you know, gender pay gap, as we uh, discussed before. Um, what's your, I suppose my question is, what's, what are your issues? Uh, and, and then how do you, what, what do you, are you, are you conscious of trying to create change in those issues or around those issues? And, and how do you do that? I feel like I'm a really, really pessimistic person. So change, deeply, deeply pessimistic. So for me, change is quite a lofty ambition, right? And so like, to me, that's obviously it's like a hope, but it's way, way far off. And the more short-term immediate goal is just to make sure that I'm capturing stuff accurately in a way that um, allows people to feel seen and, and like to see themselves in the work. Um, yeah, I guess. And just also to render information accurately in a way that helps people to make better informed decisions for their own lives. Right. Um, so that's the goal. And I think I apply that goal to like, as you say, a, a, quite a wide range of subjects, because in addition to being a pessimist, I'd say I'm, I have a relatively short attention span. And so I get excited by like 
this subject over here and then I get excited by something else over there. And you find that a lot in journalism, like a lot of journalists, unless you unless you go over to the investigative desk when they're like these, this other breed who are willing to work at something for like three years, but everyone else is quite willing to like obsess over a subject for 24 hours, maybe a week, and then turn their attention elsewhere. Um, and I think I'm a bit like that, yeah. Uh, you do have some issues you go back to, don't you? You have um, you have some that are very dear to you. I mean, can you yeah. can you name them? Yeah, I mean, it's so interesting. Like, I would have if we were doing this talk a couple of years ago, I would have never ever named this. But I feel comfortable now to say that Palestine has been like a long-standing issue that I felt difficult yeah. finding the language to kind of talk about. Um, obviously, like you know, women's rights, gender equality, um, racial justice are ones that I come back to over and over again. And I think a lot of those, in fact, I know a lot of those were issues before I moved to America, but ones that came up specifically while I was living over there, um, you know, the criminal justice system is just like really at the forefront of your mind when you're there. Um, they're kind of the issues that even though I say, yeah, you're turning your attention all the time, you can't actually escape from them because I'll go down and take the subway and I'll see two police officers arresting a girl. And like you spend the rest of your day just obsessing over like what, what happened to her, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah, anyway, they're, they're inescapable, even if you wanted to turn your attention elsewhere. Yeah, I, I, I agree about that. I was going to ask a question about that, actually, which is, um, uh, you know, I was reading um, a bio of you and you studied the Paris Institute of Political Studies. You also worked at the International Organization for Migration. So it's like politi politics and policy has been, um, you know, a thread throughout your career. And I, I was just going to ask a sort of general question is, is politics a core component of creativity right now and it's like um sort of a bit of a pet subject of mine but is there any work that's not political i would say yes i think it becomes a philosophical question right of is like is not taking a stand a political act and then maybe in that case you're right right because especially one of the shocks coming back has been i would say among, I wouldn't necessarily say this is part of British culture compared to American culture. Maybe it's just the people that I know. I just know loads of British people that are like, oh, we don't like to talk about politics. And that to me is like, it's literally a vote for the status quo. And that is, yeah. so I've completely talked myself around. I was going to say not all work is political, but I would say like really vanilla boring crap is saying there's nothing wrong with what's going on right now and that to me is a political statement yeah yeah that's kind of how I feel about it um I sort of think that if you're if you're to, if you're taking on for example a version of that would be if you're taking on a project in the extractive economy even if you're saying even if you're sort of blind to that um you're being political because you're furthering a value system that's not inclusive um yeah. so I think I think no, I think no works no work is not political yeah um are you, um, uh, tell us a little bit about um, data and data visualization. Well, no, let me ask you a question about that first, yeah. actually. What's your, what's your, what do you call yourself? So, you know, you've been a columnist, an illustrator, data designer, presenter, artist, podcaster, filmmaker, uh, and more, I suspect. And what words have you used to describe yourself and what words do you use now? Yeah. I think I was a little bit jammy earlier on in my career and would kind of be willing to call myself kind of whatever it was necessary to get the job. Um, but I think now I probably more consistently call myself a journalist because I think that's the kind of, that's the kind of mindset that I bring to whatever I'm doing, even if I'm working on like, you know, a, a TV, a piece of writing for TV, there's an element of it where I'm trying to, I'm trying to, render something in that fiction that comes from reality you know so yeah whether it's a tiktok or an instagram or whatever it is i think i'm a, kind of a bit of a journalist throughout yeah i think that word works really well um of course i should i've completely forgotten we we're, we're hungry and we need our starter and um <laughs> i think why don't we go why don't we go to that why don't you tell us about a project um or a piece that you did early on that sort of gave us a, an indication of where you were heading um, yeah, when you asked for this, I struggled somewhat, but then I thought about this image that my sister sent me via WhatsApp when she was clearing out my mum's home. Um, 
I don't have a date for this, but I assume I was maybe like six or seven. Um, and it's a drawing. I don't know what the teacher's prompt was. I have no idea. But it's a drawing of a naked child doing a piss. And it's really quite creepy and strange. Um, and then underneath it, I've written, the teacher's written in quite clear letters, go to toilet go or go to the toilet. So I think our prompt was like, why is it important to go to the toilet? And draw, I, I have, I honestly have no clue. I have no clue what the, <laughs> what the brief was on this one. Um, but yeah, I wrote underneath it. If you don't go to toilet, you get poo and wee on your knickers. Something really dark. Um, however, I would say that to me, this is a great piece of work. You see some meticulous shading, some patterning, real attention to detail. I don't know if you can tell, but above the sink is a reflection of the back of my head. Like, oh yeah, that for me, is great work. Um, <laughs> I've drawn on some small breasts on myself because why not? Um, but the reason why I included it is because when I was really, really young, I loved, loved, loved to draw. And I think that somewhere along the way, I kind of felt like that wasn't a sensible thing to do. Like, that's not the thing that gets you the job and the stability. And right. even as a young child, I felt that. Like, literally, my earliest memory is doing one of those butterfly, you know, the things where you, like, paint and you do the thing. And my earliest memory is opening up and being like, this isn't good enough. I'm never going to get a good job. Um, so I think I knew that it wasn't a sensible thing to do. So basically, from the time that I drew this, to just after I moved to America. I never really carried on the practice of drawing. But I think looking back on this work, like all of the elements are there. Um, I created a, a video series after I moved to America called Vagina Dispatches. Like I am obsessed with our bodies. Um, I Maybe I'm obsessed with poo and wee. Uh, my friends always tell me that I like go into way too much detail about that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, I think I think it's all there. And it's obviously, um, you know, there's a, a comment on authority in that drawing as well, isn't there? Oh, this is deep, Naresh. How is there a comment on authority? Well, it's about what a teacher wants you to do, right? Uh -huh. and, and you need to follow that, and the and you and the results of you not following that. So you're, you're seeing the world through an authoritarian or anti-authoritarian lens. I would say even then. I think that's really humorous. I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it. That's, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, and so tell us about drawing. So you stopped drawing because you didn't think it was... I just thought it was, like, futile. Like, I remember my sister is two years older than me, and she went to university to go to art school, and my mum was just saying over and over again, like, well, that's a terrible decision. Um, you know, if she really enjoyed art, she should go into plastic surgery. That's quite artistic <laughs> and would manage to pay the bills. And my sister to this day is infinitely more talented than me and didn't end up pursuing a career in the arts because it was like so, so difficult. So I think like the odds really are stacked against you. Um, and I think I was only able to circle back to it once I had the financial stability of a good job and the deep depression of not having any other choice but to draw to literally stay the same. Yeah, because in a way, um, I know in your main course, you're not going to, oh, you are going to show one drawing and a painting, aren't you? Yeah. Um, but there's something around um, your data visualizations that um, I've come to know you for. Um, where there is something around the drawing style that's a, a big part of the way the information you you give or the sort of the accu you know the accuracy of uh, the way you portray the situation it's got some there's something around um a charm or a naivety that sort of lets that lets that information come through it's part of the package isn't it um, i hope so yeah yeah like yeah. i'm trying to communicate um uncertainty and i think that the notion of uncertainty is something that is not really very often emphasized in data right data is packaged as something that's perfectly precise and accurate and the people who understand data are the people who have absolute certainty about whether it's going to be like the next u.s presidential election outcome or like the weather forecast for tomorrow and i think what i'm trying to put back in is that there are many things even when it comes to data that we don't know about it and i guess that uncertainty inherently has a bit of a childlike 
quality maybe because I think children are maybe a bit more willing to admit their uncertainty maybe I don't know yeah I, I I think so I think so and also you know there's um there's kind of a uh, you know the, you're making some hard comments in a lot of these on a lot of these pieces aren't you you're actually critiquing a power system or a government or author authoritarian figure or um you know um a tradition for example and actually these things are are quite tough and actually you're making them a little bit more palatable i'm not i'm not sure that you're softening them but i think you're making them a little bit more palatable with an illustration the style you do it with i think that's how i think about it i mean honestly that's what i'm kind of striving for because i think um, I think there's such a temptation to look away, like whether it's looking away from an ugly child or looking away from a, an abuse of power. And if you can render it in a way that just allows people to kind of look at the screen for an extra beat, it means that they can walk away with perhaps a little bit more information. But that's really hard, right? If you think about something like police killings, how do you show that in a way that isn't just a standard bar chart? but also is done with sensitivity to the fact that like some of the people who are looking at this might, you know, might have actually lost a loved one. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I agree. A great, a great question from Jesse, which is um, what process do you go through to make the data understandable and fun for your illustrations? Um, that's a really good question. Um, I think it varies a little bit depending on the, on, it just varies a little bit for every single illustration. But generally, I tr the first thing I'm trying to do is to almost think of the visual language. So you mentioned up top the most recent illustration that I published, which is about um, companies like Amazon that are donating to homophobic politicians, as well as like selling rainbow merch all month. Um, and so the visual, I don't know why, but I just started to think about Care Bears. And then when I thought about Care Bears, I thought about that really weird thing that they do where like they burst a rainbow from their stomachs. And then I was like, okay, so the rainbows can be the bars. But that very first point of the visual language, I think is the really critical one. It's like just, yeah, what's gonna somehow tie the subject to the data in a visual way um, and just be kind of nice to draw and nice to look at. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's a great answer. Um, Megan, a question from Megan. Um, you were talking about Instagram, we were talking about your 440,000 followers. Ha um, Megan's asking, have you changed your approach since you became bigger on Instagram and are more aware of, and became more aware of people sharing your work? So, good question, good question yeah. Um, I always get asked actually, why don't you sign your work? And because it, it very often gets shared in ways that aren't then credited back to me, including by the most devilish Instagram account. If anyone who's following this, don't follow at feminist. It's run by a white dude who profits like obscene money. It's the largest Instagram account for feminists. I don't know. It's like got millions and millions of followers. And he very often would share my work without credit. And then like, because he has such a larger platform, people would assume that I had copied that work. So anyway, people talk about watermarks and stuff, but I ultimately feel like um, men like that are in the evil minority. And generally it's more important that my work is shared than that it's credited to me. Cause I think most people aren't profiting off of it when they're sharing it, right? Um, and then the only other thing that is worth mentioning is that, yeah, like, especially as a woman, Early on, I would like just do Instagram stories to be like, hey, I'm here. And then I started to get a few emails and messages from like crusty, weird men saying, I'm here, like I'm looking for you. Um, so now I just do things about my safety. Like I never ever post about a place when I'm in a place, um, right. which right. I think is probably just best practice regardless of your follower count. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that probably is. Isn't it? I mean, are you, as your audience has grown, have you felt a greater responsibility towards them? Is there a response? I, I imagine there is, having half a million followers on it nearly. I think there is, there must be a responsibility. How do you deal with that? I think it's like, I always accept that every single post is going to fuck up, right? Like no post is perfect, but it's about deciding what the threshold for a fuck up is. And it's like, if you are causing actual harm to people, then that's the point at which like the post has to be reconsidered. Um, 
And the thing that's really difficult is you're trying to anticipate that before you hit like the share button. Um, yeah, basically it's, it's really, really difficult. Um, I, I am constantly afraid of, I don't want to use the language being cancelled because I personally think, I, I think I mentioned this before to you when we were talking, I think cancel culture is kind of great. And I think the people that um, criticise it are not the people who are actually at risk of being cancelled truly. Um, but I, I think, and I think, yeah, I think ultimately it makes me better, but I do kind of just worry about when, when I'm going to mess up. And by and by saying, deciding the threshold of the fuck up, which I think is a fantastic yeah. quote, you're saying someone's always going to get upset or annoyed by by what you do. Yeah, because you're commenting on an issue, right? You're engaged with an issue, and you're trying to uh, correct a misperception or, or or you know provide an extra piece of truth yeah. that someone may or may not like, right? So that that's what it is: is someone's going to get upset, but how many and for what reason is what you need to figure out. Yeah, and I can give like a really specific example of that as well. I remember I did a post about how the tech industry was super male dominated. And again, I, I'm honestly not always drawing penises, but I drew small penises as like bar charts to be like, you know, 70% of Facebook employees, I'm just quoting random numbers here, 70% of Facebook employees, men, 80% of Uber employees, blah, blah, blah. And people started commenting in the, in the, you know, in the comments underneath saying, you're making like, these two things synonymous. And I thought about that before I posted, I was like, yeah, but most of the people who are working there are cis men, right? So it's okay to make this assumption. And people in the comments were like, you know, you're still reinforcing the idea that everyone who has a dick is a man and everyone who is a man has a dick. Yeah. Um, and that's still harmful visual language. And they were absolutely right. Like that's not helpful. And it's a really, really difficult challenge as a creative to come up with what is one really fast visual code that communicates to people this means man and this means woman like like that encaptures in the data I mean this means man and this means woman according to like who is classified in the data without reinforcing harmful norms and that's a difficult challenge but I think it's good to be challenged like that and I ended up doing a project ages later because I hate you know the little circles with the arrow and the cross like I always get them confused. What, is, what does it even mean? Um, so I ended up just doing one where I just use M's and W's to mean man and woman. And I felt like that was like pretty effective of not reinforcing weird gender stereotypes. Yeah. That's really interesting about, do you think, do you think the danger of fast is that it can always, um, fast is something that's widely accepted by people, but that meaning may have changed. That's the danger of something that's fast and easily communicatable isn't it is there may be subtleties that have grown up around that but that concept isn't yeah that's a perfect example yeah um, and fast is essential I think especially for something like data where like I can't change all of your norms and understanding of what man and woman are in this one chart necessarily but maybe I can start to shift it yeah anyway sorry that doesn't really add anything I shouldn't have said that um Emily Jane's asking um um, saying that you're, uh, I feel like your work is very unique um, here, here. Um, so you might not have this, but what's your advice for not comparing yourself to others? I don't think it's because my work is unique that I don't compare myself to others, because I don't think it is necessarily unique, although I'll take the compliment. Um, I don't know. I, I don't really have advice. Like I, my mum always, always, always said to us growing up, like, remember, no one is above you. You must never, ever, ever have any idols and no one is below you and you must never, ever, ever look down on anyone. And I think we, we spend a lot of time trying to focus on like not looking up at people, but maybe like there's like a pendulum effect where the more that you look down on people, the more that you also look up at people. So maybe if you stop looking down on people, you also stop looking up at people. I don't know. I don't fucking know. <laughs> Sorry. I have no advice. Um, Johan's asking, how do you channel simple data without being reductive? How can you capture nuance in the data? Mm, that's a really good question. Again, it's finding all kinds of new ways, I guess, to think about uncertainty. So I'm doing, I'm doing a podcast at the moment where we just have this really, really simple statistic, which is the number of birds that die each year by flying into buildings. Oh, right. And I think in the US it's between 600 million and a billion birds, I think fly into buildings each year or 300 million to a, bi a billion anyway huge number and something as simple as that like 
there's all kinds of beautiful ways of showing uncertainty, whether it's like a dashed line rather than a solid one or shading. And those kinds of things I think are quite useful tools. I've almost forgotten what the question was and I don't know if I'm answering how, how do you channel simple data without being reductive? And yeah, so that's simple, but I think also shows like it implies, yeah, I don't think it's reductive, hopefully. Right. I'm not sure if I ever really understood the word reductive, Marish. I think, I think too, too simplistic. So you simplify it so much that it's not it's quite not the meaning. Yeah. Yeah. I think. I think. Okay. Um, uh, Johan, you can always just tell me if we've got that right or not. Um, should we um, move on to your main course, oh. which is a terrific project? So okay. why, don't you take, why don't you talk us through it? Um, so this main project was called 100 New Yorkers. Um, where I drew 100 New Yorkers. And um, this was the final image that I posted on Instagram, but we're gonna circle through like a bagazillion that I post on Instagram stories to kind of walk through my process. And um, this ended up being, I actually kind of created it with maybe, well, actually the truth is, I feel reluctant to say this, the truth is that I pitched it to the New Yorker hoping it would be a cover. <laughs> and they said, no, I mean, it's incredibly ambitious to like have never been published by the New Yorker before and be like, I have a cover for you. Um, so they said no, I really shouldn't be saying this but anyway, they said no, but that they would be willing to publish it inside the magazine. And I think I had worked on it for so many months that I was like, mm, can we not publish it inside of the magazine? So I ended up redoing it and making it about COVID-19 and pitching it to the New York Times, which is where it ended up living. And I felt I felt good about that in the end. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so the next images will just show, literally I created these for Instagram stories. I was documenting my whole process and you can see like how I collected all of the numbers of like, what does it mean to say 100 New Yorkers, right? So the goal was to look at New York's demographics in terms of, age, disability status, immigration status, race and ethnicity, and gender, um, and to rent, turn them into percentages. So let's say 2% of New Yorkers are black women under the age of 45, then I would have two characters out of those 100 that are black women under the age of 45. Um, so hopefully when you look at that total composition of 100 people, it represents 100% of New York. Um, obviously that is a flawed approach because the data is imperfect, um, but it still felt like it was worthwhile. This is me drawing the initial sketches. Uh, I think there's a really horrible image coming up of me in a sandwich. Uh, um, but all of these were shared on Instagram stories to just literally talk through how long each step took me, how the colouring process went, how I scanned the images. Um, and the final upshot of all of this was that I created a painting. Um, I think I just started it just before the pandemic. I like stretched the canvas. I've never done that before. Prepped the canvas. I've never done that before. Um, used a projector to come up with the composition. Um, and then, yeah, during the pandemic, just started painting it. And um, then it ended up being a piece of work at the World Trade Center. Yeah. These are the demographics which I checked with um, a colleague of mine. Um, because I thought it was really, really easy to get them fucked up. And all of those weird colour boxes you see that aren't pale green are where he disagreed with my calculations. And it was so interesting to talk them out. Um, so just like a weird data point here, New York State publishes data about what, how many New Yorkers there are that are men, women, obviously they, they, do, they don't count transgender populations or non-binary people, um, how many are in each age group and how many are of each race or ethnicity. But to figure out the thing that I just told you, which is how many black women are there that are in this age group, you kind of have to make a few assumptions. And that's what I was talking about with this colleague of mine, which I found to be like just a really interesting conversation. Like for example, I had to make, I think it was 11% of New Yorkers have some form of disability and choosing which of these 11 characters I'm going to give a disability to and how many of those should be a, vi a visual, a visible disability that you can see on the, on the awesome. canvas. Yeah, yeah, it's hard. Yeah. It's hard. And in the final thing that I actually ended up doing, I created like a slideshow that highlighted, like I had the 100 characters and as you tap through, like, you know, 89 of the characters would disappear and the 11 that were left had, had disabilities, but it was super arbitrary how I chose them. Mm. Yeah. 
but it's, it's consciously a representation of New York, right? It's a microcosm of New York. Yeah. Um, and what was the what was the intention? Why did you choose to do that in the first place? I honestly just really wanted to cover the New Yorker narration. It was <laughs> nothing particularly deeper than that. Um, but I also just thought that, like you know, as I said, like the goal of my work is to make is to help make sure that people can be seen and I hope like this is the city that I live in and so like look at that people will feel like oh I can see myself and it's really sweet whenever I had friends come over they would be like oh which one is me and wander up to the canvas and like everyone kind of managed to find someone that they felt was like visually similar-ish to themselves um but having said that you know like those race categories that exist in New York State and nationally in the US never ever include the category Arab. So I've never been in any data set that I've ever looked at in the US. Um, and I think that informs some of my skepticism that like, you know, I spent two years really working on this massive piece that didn't reflect me. I was just like one of the others. Yeah. Yeah. Do you feel, I'm, I know you said you were a, a pessimist earlier, but do you feel that these things are changing, these sensitivities are changing, um, that people are getting more, um, more more inclusive or more attuned to the idea of being inclusive at the worst and more inclusive at the best, and that other, um, you know, a richer set of voices and a broader representation, these are things, these things are, ro these things are rolling back, this is becoming better, or mm -hmm. do you feel the progress is too slow? I definitely think progress is too slow, 100%. And I also think that the progress is not linear. And I worry a lot about the backlash. I've had private conversations with white friends who are, who are saying to me, like, I feel really, really nervous about my ability to get a job. Like between you and me, it does feel like all of the jobs are going to people of color, which is like a really distressing thing to hear as a person of color because it does imply that like everything I've gotten is from some kind of positive action scheme and that like the world has completely changed in our favor. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I think there's going to be, I think there's going to be, maybe this is just me being scarred still from Trump, um, but I think the backlash is going to continue and I think it's going to be really difficult. I mean, why, why would you feel, I mean, you could choose not to feel um, worried by that. You could choose to feel, um, like the, the the scales have tipped in your favor for the first time and it's long overdue. Mm. I, don't, I wouldn't say that the scales have tipped in my favor. I don't know who could possibly be at the door. I'm not gonna answer it, it should be fine. Um, I wouldn't say that the scales have tipped in my favor because I don't think we're there yet. Yeah. I don't know. I think, oh God, this is quite a crass way to put it. I think I'm worried because I think we're at a point where like, and we were probably at this point before, where like maybe white people have to do some of the work of the soul searching of like what happens next, and I think that's going to be really really difficult. I was going to ask, where does that leave? Where does this current situation leave white designers or white creative people now? You know, where, what what is the right way for them to express their their voice other than against? Yeah, which is not what we're talking about. I think in in, in 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 actually contributing to progress, what 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 do you see? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think a lot of white creators are probably struggling with this, right? Like, and it goes back to your very very first. I don't think it was very very first, but early on when you used to have like, it's all creative work, um, political, right? And I think that there are a lot of. I'm not going to speak on behalf of white creators. I'm going to speak on on behalf of myself and a lot of the white creative work that I've seen. There's either like a business as usual approach which again is political because it's upholding the status quo, or there's like a really weird co-opting of different cultures and, you know, you've seen it all, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And actually, I think the thing that would be really, really productive and powerful was, would be for white people to reflect on whiteness and to create really interesting creative work about the nature of whiteness. Yeah. Um, but I think that's difficult for a lot of white people to do. Yeah. And sadly, a lot of white supremacists are doing all that work because <laughs> white liberals aren't really comfortable doing it. I mean, it's such an interesting, it's such an interesting question. And I think if there's anyone at home sort of watching this and has got something to say about that question, it'd be great to hear from you, put it in the chat. You don't have to ask it as a question to 
Mona, you could just sort of um, comment on it. Um, uh, what, um, I was going to ask you a slightly different question, which is that are you, are you, a, are you a collaborator or are you a lone wolf? And there's no judgment either way. That's such a good question. And it's one that I was speaking about not that long ago to a friend. The job that I took when I moved to America really, really changed me forever. Um, the people that I was working with, it'd be really simplistic to say they were bad people, but I kind of want to be simplistic. Um, I had a miserable, miserable time. And I think it's made me really wary of long, long-term collaborations. So right. to answer your question, like freelancing is amazing for me because I like, I jump into these groups and there's like, everyone loves each other and there's such positive energy and there's no weird, like all these less apparent politics because yeah, the, the politics don't work in quite the same way. And then I jump back out again and disappear. Um, but I will also say that the more that you um, start to grow your career as a freelancer, there's no such thing really as being a lone wolf if you still want to grow. So I have a literary agent. I have an agent that manages speaking requests. I have a different agent that manages um, illustration requests. But like there's a team. I have a lawyer, an accountant, um, and they do work that isn't visible and isn't necessarily um, regarded as important, but it's critical for me to be able to do my work. Um, so yeah, I want to give credit, like I'm still part of a team, you know, it's just that not every, yeah, they just, it's just a different kind of team. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, how do you get to, how have you got yourself to this situation? Because I think um, for many people tuning in today, I think they will look at you and your, kind of, your strength of conviction and your independence and just wonder how anyone can get there I'm sort of wondering the same thing looking at you as well um, and listening to you how do you get to that how have you sort of earned your way into that position or how have you built your business to get to that place of independence I would say I was really 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 pragmatic and like not particularly brave or courageous I think if I was brave or courageous I would have like started doing all of this in my early 20s I think I like but can I say you are brave or courageous now? Because if you have an idea for the New Yorker, pitch it to them as a cover, and they say, we'll put it inside, and you say no, and get it onto the New York Times magazine, I guess? Yeah. Instead, that's pretty brave. So you have picked that up. But see, I think bravery bravery is only, only exists relative to your power, right? And... And to even even that move, okay, like that. Those are both such important institutions that I can't afford to piss off either of them, which is why I'm still hesitant to even say it in this space. But that Instagram following does equate to power, and like that decision in the context of having that Instagram following isn't as brave as someone who's doing it who like is their first and only big break to work with those organisations. So I feel like at the time that I chose to go freelance, I already had a little bit of power. And I think the most important form of power for most of us is economic power. And I'd saved up for three years. I was in a well-paid job and I slowly, secretly started cheating on my employer and started doing freelance jobs that they didn't know about at a time when like, if I would have got fired, I could have afforded to support myself. Um, so I was just incredibly cautious. Right. Yeah. Right, interesting. So yes, as you say, that's not, that's the opposite of brave, but that's that sounds very pragmatic to me. Um, interesting question from Carla. Yeah. Did you have to learn about data before illustration, or was it the other way around? That's a really good question. I learned about data first. So um, as part of my degree course, the one that I didn't drop out of, the second one that I did, um, I went to go and work for the International Organization for Migration, as you mentioned, and I was learning about data and statistics there while feeling, again, disillusioned, which again is like a recurring theme, I guess, in, in, uh, in my career. So I learned about the data first, and it was only when I was in this job when, that I moved to the US for, which was all about data journalism, that I started to try to teach myself some illustration stuff. Right, so it's that way around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. But, uh, but you've always been interested in drawing while you were at, at an early age. We yeah, yeah. Together. There you go, Carla, you got your answer. Um, I wondered if it'd be a, a good time to move on to the um, next meal. Yeah. So the next meal is, um, 
um, I ask our dinner guests to actually choose something that they haven't done, but they've seen somewhere else that's inspiring them about what creativity can be. So what have you selected for us today, Mona? Um, it's an artist that I discovered on Instagram. I know it sounds like I'm like promoting Instagram, but I'm really, really not. Um, but I just, I think their work is incredible. Like as soon as I saw it, I was just like, I want it on my walls. I want it on my, just everywhere. The colors are amazing. The compositions are amazing. It's an artist called Mansion Low. This is uh, one of her pieces. I mean, I don't even think it needs an explanation. Like surely everyone that's looking at this thinks it's great. I think it's really emotive. Um, so emotive. It's, yeah, it's just beautiful. And actually I'm trying to understand a little bit more about, um, I wouldn't say this style of design because I wouldn't know, I don't know if she would describe herself as like, um, I don't know how she'd describe her work, but I'm, I'm working at the moment on an animated um, TV show where I want to completely change the style of work that I make. And I would say that this is like a North Star for me. Like imagine if this was animated, like how can I make something that's half as good as this and turn it into motion? Yeah. And are you looking at this because this is a little different from what you do? Is, da is data like this? Yeah, like I think it's different because it's just so much better. Like the complexity of her illustrations, the way that she uses shadow and light. Like, I don't know how to do that. My illustrations look like, you know, they were done by a teenage kid on a school trip or something, you know? Like I need to up my game a little bit, yeah. Right. Does, does, Manch does Manchin know you're a fan? I mean, I've DM'd her a couple of times just saying, you know, I love her work and I try to, I try to be quite um, diligent about sharing people's work on my own Instagram so that, you know, I can get, give back, I mean, I hate the expression give back, you know what I mean? I benefited a lot from other people doing that. I would like to do the same. Um, so yeah, I've also shouted her out a few times. And do you know if anyone else has got the bump, that, the type of bump that you got from, from you? Has that happened? Yeah, people have said to me before that they have gotten quite a significant bump. And that almost feels quite, I mean, it's great, but it also feels quite scary because it's a, it's a, an important reminder of the power that you have. If yeah. you're like merely doing an Instagram story, someone then DMs you to say, I've got a thousand extra follows. That's wild. And that happens. Yeah, not a thousand necessarily, but like a friend of mine who runs a Palestinian rights organization, I shared some of the resources that they offer and she was like, it was huge. Yeah, hundreds. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, as you're talking today, it makes me realize just how, um, you know, Instagram can feel very spontaneous, but it's also, it needs to be very judicious, doesn't it? And when yeah. you're carrying, I suppose it doesn't really matter what scale of following you've got. I think there is a responsibility when you publish to be fair um, and to be well-researched, especially in your field as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, and as you say, sort of deciding the threshold of the fuck up, which I think is, I'm gonna take that one with me. Um, and what's, what is it? So when you look at that illustration you've just shown, and we see some of your work, and obviously you do paintings, I mean, and you do, and your work, I would say, even in through data visualizations can be very emotional. I think as many emotions it triggers or taps. Um, what do you think data visualization does uniquely, or what is it best at? Or when you use it, what do you, what do you know you can do with it totally reliably? You know, when you're creating something, the parts that you're stripping away, like the cutting room floor stuff, sometimes you're just like, no, 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 I, I can't afford to lose that. That's the meat of it. And sometimes like keeping that in means that it has to be animated or it has to be in sound or it has to be a written piece. But sometimes all of that trimming, when when like you still are left with the most substantial and like meaning, meaningful part of it, and that's enough to distill in a data visualization. And that's the time that I go for data visualization, basically. Right. So it's, it's that particular moment. It's got a job and it, it can do it. Yeah. What have you? <laughs> do you need to check? <laughs> oh, it's fine. It's fine. Um, when, when has it not worked? When have you tried it and it hasn't worked? So many times. Um, Tell us a fail or two. I think it will encourage us all. OK, this is a really bad one, right? I was trying to come up with, it, there was a whole conversation that was happening about um, false rape allegations, right? Um, right? This was a conversation that was happening in the US, but I assume also over here. I would say largely led by a few women, but mostly men who were saying, you know, what about these false allegations that happen? And to me, that felt like, um, 
I mean, aside from like, it's really difficult, right? Because there, there's a point when you, sh you shouldn't need data, right? Like the need to believe women, I think even if like the statistics were showing it's like one in 20 allegations or one in 10,000, yeah. it doesn't yeah. change the fact that you should believe not even just women, sexual assault survivors. And so I drew an illustration that was a horse where like the the thing on the horse represented like was like 0.05 percent of the horse or whatever you know like it's a tiny on the area size of the horse um and that was the false allegations and it was trying to show how like it's a unicorn and like unicorns don't really exist anyway um this is the crucial importance of showing work to other people before you publish it like i sent it to a bunch of friends and they were like this is horrific um it's ugly it makes no sense like I don't want to look at something that represents sexual assault and is a unicorn like it's just yeah. bad yeah um, and I think that sort of saved my I mean that's a weird example but it's just something like that yeah 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 the close close fail but not a fail yeah yeah that is why it's good to show things to people sometimes isn't it definitely. yeah yeah definitely I was just gonna ask I know you like to um speak and you also uh teach don't you as well very exciting, yeah um, when you speak, so teach, what do you like to talk about and what do you speak about? Such a good Honestly, the only reason why I say yes to teaching is the opportunity to listen because right. I really feel like when else do I get to sit in a room with like 30 people who were all executing a visualization about the exact same set of data and to see how 30 different minds work? Like it's amazing. Someone will come up with like a I don't know, just like a totally different method of, of placing the key or using colour or something. So um, those are the things that I get most excited about. But what do I talk about when I when I give talks? Honestly, I mean, I'm sure a lot of the creatives in this call are going to be interested in the money side of things, which I know it feels quite crass to ask about, especially like, you know, British culture and stuff. But the main reason why I do talks is because that's like the lion's share of my of my earnings before yeah. Anyway, yeah, that obviously massively changed after the pandemic when speaking rates, either the speaking gigs disappeared or they were tr like shrunk down to basically nothing, which was really difficult because um, it's obviously harder to do this via Zoom, I would say. Um, but yeah, that's the that's the biggest that was the biggest share of my of my income. Yeah, really right. big. Yeah, and then teaching is listening. I think is a is a really great is a great thing. Um, Look, I think that's um, that's a bit, just been absolutely brilliant today, Mona. Thank you so much. Um, uh, let's just wrap up. I just want to say some thanks uh, more broadly. Um, um, even though I've said it every time, Felix Townsend, who was a New Blood winner um, last summer, he um, did our lovely foodie identity with all the plates and um, knives and forks and all that. So thank you to him. And to Yuri, who's my partner at um, Pentagram. He's a brilliant designer and he did the fantastic intro, intro music with all the uh, forks and knives and pots and those sounds. Okay. And of course, thanks to everyone for coming today and asking the questions. Uh, and most of all, thanks to the brilliant Mona Chalabi. Um, so this dinner will be, this dinner with will be up on DNA D site in a matter of days. Uh, so you're very welcome to see it again or pass it on to someone who didn't, because I think everyone should see this. Um, and in July, we've got no dinner with, but there is plenty of inspiration, of course, in next week's New Blood Festival, which runs from Monday to Thursday. And then dinner with we'll be back in August when we've got a conversation with this year's President's Award winner, the uh, wonderful director Kim Garrick. So that's a, a real goodie too. Um, so until then, uh, thank you so much. And Mona Chalabi, that was absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone. <laughs>